Hello everyone, Carmine from New York here with another photography class. How's everybody? First things first, thank you. On behalf of me and my channel, Carmine Taverna Photography, I want to thank you guys. We made it to 1,000 subscribers. Oh lordy, it almost took 10 years and 600 and I don't know, 40,000 views, but we did it. Thanks to you. Thank you 1,000 times to each of you who have subscribed to this channel and made this guy's dream come true. I hit a thousand subscribers. I feel like I won the Academy Award without punching anybody in the face or slapping them. <laughs> Guys, I really want to thank you. It's very important to me personally that I achieve this thousand subscribers plateau. It means nothing monetarily. I never did this YouTube channel to earn any money and I most likely won't. That's just the way things go with this algorithm stuff. But that's not why I do this channel. I do this channel to help my fellow photographers. And in the meantime, with your feedback and you guys referring me to other YouTube photography channels, I've been learning. So I just want to thank you guys. We did it. We made it. This channel has a thousand subscribers as of yesterday. Thank you very much. So let's get on with the show. What are we talking about to here by this beautiful lake in New York City? If you remember two or three classes ago, I mentioned about don't be a sensor size queen. It got a lot of hits, uh, but I meant every word of it. Sensor size, right? Full frame guys versus the APS-C guys. And those guys versus the micro, micro four thirds guys. And then you have the digital medium format guys against everybody. So I made a video and please go see it. That's called Don't Be a Sensor Size Queen. Uh, you really enjoy it. But in that video, I talked about how it doesn't matter what camera you use, right? Micro Four Thirds all the way up to digital medium format to a cell phone, film cameras, 35 millimeter film or medium format film or sheet film. It just doesn't matter. What matters is to eventually in your photography career, in your photography journey, in your photography artistic motivation there's rules now there are rules in almost ev everything that has been around a while and is on the professional level if you go to vegas to play blackjack there's rules right and if you go to play blackjack across the country in atlantic city it's the same rules if you go to watch a basketball game those rules in ohio are the same basketball rules as in Florida and, and on and on and on. It's the same for football and golf, etc., etc. There are rules and there's no difference in photography. Photography has basic rules that you build your foundation, the foundation of your photography artistic work your work will be built upon the foundation of basic rules. So once you have the basic rules down firm, you start to build your photography art. And that's what this is all about. The art of the photograph, something you can enjoy, sell, hang on the wall, put in a portfolio, put on Instagram, Hopefully even get your own website where you share and if you want, sell your work. All right. One thing I have to say for each of the rules, you know, I have notes, right? 
because once you get over 60, you need notes. Um, each of the rules I'm about to go over, and, I'll, and I'm just going to go over them briefly, and at the end I'll explain why. The hint is right here. For each of the rules I'm about to go over, I will show you a photograph ex that exemplifies that rule, okay? So for example, the first rule is leading lines. So at the end of the video, you'll see photo my photographs that I took with leading lines and why they're important. What is a leading line and why is it important? A leading... Oh. This is what happens when you film with your cell phone. You get spam calls anyway. So leading lines. A leading line is to me something I try and incorporate into every photograph. You can't, but I try and incorporate it into every photograph. Here's an example. I don't know if this is going to be the example I'm going to show you at the end of the video, but an example might be, say this railing right you could have you're taking a portrait of your friend you just have the person at the end of the railing right Le leaning on it looking at the camera and you put the camera down low perhaps even on the railing and you put the person where the line of the railing will lead the eye naturally right up to the person it is one of the most important rules you can learn now don't forget and that's just going to be a lot of words. I'm going to show you at the end examples, my examples, my professional examples of leading lines and how I incorporate it into my daily photography. The next one, rule of thirds, has been around since day one. Because don't forget, a lot of rules in photography come from the same rules as artists when they paint an oil painting or a watercolor or an acrylic the rule of thirds, it's placement of your subject. For example, right now, when you're looking at me, I'm not using the rule of thirds. Now I am. This is the rule of thirds. A rule of thirds is when there's a line here and a line here, right? So now you have, your image is now divided into three sections, like you're cutting up a Sicilian pizza, let's just say. A line here, and a line here. You make two lines and now you have thirds. I am now on one of the lines of the third. This is a, if I was taking a still photograph, this would be a better still photograph using the rule of thirds than dead ass center. This is not a good still photograph, okay? Rule of thirds, perfect rule of third photograph. If you notice, you watch a lot of my videos I have over a hundred and what I don't know over 105 videos out the ones that I film in my studio which is really my man cave you'll see that I always sit on the side I don't sit dead center if I can help it I sit on the side rule of thirds okay you'll see an example of that right at the end of this video stay tuned now the next one cropping for a pen of cropping in general you all know cropping right like if this was a photograph that you're looking at right now on your screen right I might want to crop this out right and get a tighter shot to make your subject more uh, pronounced right but we everybody knows about that I think it's a natural thing I don't really want to hammer that into your skull too much but here's what I do want to hammer into your skull 16 by 9 that aspect ratio, I like to call it panoramic, which is even tighter, right, is so gorgeous. In fact, I have a whole video. Go, if you look at all my videos, there's one about the camera. It's a film camera called Minolta P's. The letter P, apostrophe S. It's a 35 millimeter film camera. I think it has a 28 millimeter lens, but it's cropped. When you open the back of the camera, there's only a slit. It's only a panchromatic, a panoramic slit. What it does is it forces you to think 
in subjects that are long, like the picture I'll show you, the Atlantic City Boardwalk. Perfect, because it has horizontal. A row of stores, right? Horizontal. It makes your brain think. It's almost like a training wheels for your brain to start thinking panoramic. Panoramic photographs. You don't have to take seven photographs like on these beautiful cell phones now. You know, stitch them together. and No. You could do it with your regular camera. Just when you go into post or in the darkroom on your easel, just crop it this much, but the whole length of the frame. Gorgeous. It's gorgeous. When you start thinking about cropping and um, panoramic, oh, gorgeous. This works 99.9% .9 of the time outdoors. Panoramic in indoors is okay, but it's generally eh. You know what I mean? Eh. Okay. Black and white versus color. Now, listen to me. I've been a photographer for 50 years, since the 70s. If you shoot color and you bring it up, we're going to talk about not the darkroom anymore. We're going to talk about when you're doing it in post, right? You have your image up on your screen and you're in post, you have your editing software up there and you look at this picture it might be a portrait it might be a street a street photograph that you took and you're looking at it and you go man ugh, it just I, no matter what i do contrast brightness darkness sharpen it denoise it crop it's just a stuzzah. it doesn't have it switch it to black and white hit on your editing software take that color photo and just what's usually one button burp, make it black and white and just look at it for 30 seconds and then say oh my god that's all it needed it only needed to go to black and white and now it's gorgeous guys it's all about art and sometimes color is not the answer I love black and white. 50% of what I shoot is black and white. Look, this is what I mean. When I shoot with my film cameras, okay, 35 millimeter or medium format, it's 99% of the time black and white film. When I shoot digital, I always shoot in color and then make it black and white in post if need be. And just by making it black and white has saved so many photographs from turning it from just just filing it and never looking at it again to something that's now hanging up on my wall okay you'll see examples of this um, at the end of the video so let's see so aperture depth of field you guys by now most likely know about the uh, aperture and what it does it's affect on background blur called bokeh now bokeh is something that i'm so surprised lately i have seen more and more youtube photography channels crapping on it are you out of your mind background blur okay it has a uh i don't know if it's chinese or japanese word bokeh bokeh okay it's, it's just a, a name for, bokeh is another name for background out of focus, which we have been using since day one, since cameras were invented. It is a necessary basic rule. Wide aperture, take your photograph of your subject and the background will be out of focus. That is the simplest way to have attention brought onto your subject. We used to say, well, 
just shoot it and we'll crop it so your eye can't see anything else but your sub subject. But then, right, I went to photography school in the 70s and then after I finished that photography school, I did correspondence photography school, which is now what you guys would refer to as online. When I did my correspondence, my second photography school, when I did it correspondence by mail, right? You did your work, you put it in an envelope, you mailed it, a week later you got it back with your instructor's notes in a red grease pencil. Do this, do this, your shadow, what's wrong with you? You got a pole coming out of the guy's head, all this stuff. When we were going to those schools, the most important thing is, what's your subject? You're taking a picture of something, right? Now, if it's a picture of me, that's a good idea. Take a picture of me. But if it's, you know what the subject is, but when you're taking a picture of landscape, what's the subject, right? Here's a good example. A flower that is just drop dead gorgeous, that you took a nice macro shot. You know why macro shots are so gorgeous? Because the background is out of focus and your eye goes right to the inside of that flower or that insect it's so important bottom line shoot wide open now listen to me f8 on any lens any lens modern older vintage f8 is the sharpest part of any lens f8 99% of tests done on lenses, read them. And the, the testing centers that test lenses for sharpness, you know, edge to edge, etc. 99% of them say the same thing. Sharpest focus is at F8. Now that's important too. You don't want your background out of focus on everything. F8 is your sharpest portion of the lens. Now I think Ansel Adams had a club, a photography club. I think it was called the F32s. I'm pretty sure it was called the F32s. And you can imagine how small that aperture is. And I believe that that's what he shot at when he was shooting his gorgeous landscape shots. But that was him, right? He was shooting at only infinity at F32 and his film for those shots were, I believe, large format, okay? You're not gonna get those kinds of photographs with a 110 camera, <laughs> film camera. Okay, so you guys know about aperture, okay? Uh, shutter speed, right? B for bulb, it stays open for as long as you want and then when you close it, the shutter speed's done. And faster shutter speeds, 8,000, what, one eight thousandth of a second is not uncommon anymore, okay? Talk about freezing a hummingbird, that's what you wanna use. So I think you guys that are watching the channel, if you've gotten to this point in your photography and uh, you're, you're interested Right? I think by now you know fast shutter speed, that one one thousandth, one two thousandth, right? That will freeze something moving, right? Hopefully. Uh, shutter speed, slow shutter speeds, right? A half a second. If something's moving, it'll be blurry, okay? Uh, yes, you need slower shutter speeds to help with your exposure as long as it's something still right? That doesn't have any movement. What I like to do, let's just wrap this up, this shutter speed section like this. My favorite nighttime photographs are to go to a roadway at night, like around 10 p.m. Put my camera on a tripod, set it for f16 for three seconds. ISO usually 100 and get those trail marks of the lights, headlights, 
red brake lights, police lights, bus lights. So you see the trail of the light trails, but you can see the other side of the street because the car has moved and the film was exposed or the sensor was exposed when the car moved out of the way. Okay. Oh, horizon lines. You see where the horizon line is here? Okay. That's where it belongs. It's part of the rule of thirds. You never, ever, ever want your horizon line to be here in the middle of the picture. It's just something in the human brain that you've cut it in half. Your horizon line, right? That's this. Is also part of the rule of thirds. Remember I said the first rule of thirds was here. One, two, and then I'm on the other the line of the rule of thirds, right? Rule of thirds also goes this way. One, two. You can have that horizon line. You only have two choices. Up there or turn the camera up. And it comes down here on the second line of the rule of thirds. Never, ever cut your picture in half. That's about as simple as it goes. If you can just remember that, your landscape photographs have just increased 50 times. Here's something that only two other YouTube photography channels touch upon. And it's very important. Negative space. You're going to see photographs that I took pretty recently using negative space. This is what I mean. Negative space, in simple terms, let's say you take a portrait of someone. Black background that's far away, that won't be in focus. They sit eight feet in front of the black background over to the side. Lighting is only on them. Usually one light. This is, we're talking about negative space here. We're not talking about professional portraits. We're talking about how important negative space is. This is not a portrait. This is for art. The background, black. The room, dark. One light, like the sun, coming down. Usually with a snoot. A snoot is just a cone in front of your light to direct the light in one spot instead of lighting up the whole area a snoot you can make a snoot with cardboard you make a snoot put it on your light not a flash I want you guys to get used to uh, lights that are steady lights okay and they can be even those clip-on lights that you see in workshops okay that have the aluminum silver hood on it you can tape a piece of cardboard to it, make a snoot, right? It's going to be bigger than this, of course. Make a snoot, tape it on. Nobody's going to see it. You tape it on, you can take it all off when you're done and just have the light coming this way. Hold on. When you take that photograph, right, you're going to expose for the face. You take that photograph, just like this, where I am, this side of the one third, this from here, watch my finger, all the way to the end of the frame will be black. That is negative space. It's high impact art photography. You could also do it the opposite way. Having white background, same thing, your person, your subject, or, or a vase, or a, or a piece of art, or anything. Have it over to the side. And this is all negative space with a white background, meaning there's nothing. There's nothing. Now that you can't see a crack in the wall, it's just negative space. Very artistic. Not too many people talk about it. I'm going to show you examples at the end of the video. The number one problem, the number one problem when I was teaching photography, right? as an assistant teacher back in the 70s, right? When I was in my third year photography school, 
the photography class got so popular that my one professor, Robert Lonigan, he couldn't handle all of his duties plus teach everybody in the darkroom and, and in the field. He would ask for help and he asked me, he asked everybody for help, but I always volunteered. And he would say, look at this person's uh, contact sheet. Contact sheet is when you used to take all your negatives, you lay them on a piece of photographic paper, you shine a light through it, and then you just look, you develop the paper, and then you look at each photo. You put a whole roll of photographs, all 36 or 24 photographs on one photographic piece of paper, an 8 by 10 sheet, and you can look at each one. And you could circle the good ones, and then you could, with a grease pencil, you could say, crop it this way. But the number one issue with amateur and professional photographers is this your photograph is not level it's it's off now this is not just my idea or my thoughts or my experience there are websites that buy photographs they're stock photographs they keep them in these massive uh, computers, right? That if somebody, say, uh, is doing an advertisement and they need a picture of an old guy with glasses and gray beard, and if my photograph is in this thing, they can purchase that photograph. It's usually about $1.25. And now they have the rights to use it. Go to those websites. Go to stock photograph websites and look at their rules and look at their FAQ frequently asked questions and comments number one problem is the reason they reject photographs from being put into their data bank for stock photographs is the photo is not level it's crooked today modern cameras you want to see a deer Can you see him? Where is he over there? You see him walking? It's so beautiful. And you're in New York City. And there he goes. <laughs> okay, I digress. Okay. Um, what were we talking about? All right. Modern cameras today, they do have me get back in my rule of thirds. Modern cameras today, for the most part, do have um, built-in level, electronic levels in them, right, to help you, to assist you in getting level photographs. It's very important. Here's why. If you think for a second that you're going to go into post and straighten it, guess what? You're going to lose the bottom, the side, the top. It has to crop it so much, it's not good anymore. The photo is not good anymore get the f image get your photograph level in the camera don't rely on post for everything uh, let's see so many other things I want to go over I don't even know how long we've been going but um, I'll just run through them quickly basic lens care right you have to keep your lenses clean first you blow the, the front element rear element off with a blower Second thing you do is you get a Q-tip. You put one drop of lens cleaning fluid. I use Zeiss lens cleaning fluid. One drop, you clean it. The other side, you dry it. And you do that a few times, front and rear element. Then you have to blow it again. And you're not done until you get a loop, a magnifying glass. And you look. And then you have to remove the little bits of cotton that are left behind. Or swirl marks. If they're swirl marks, you go back in with a dry cotton swab and you just keep going. Not too hard because you don't want to rub off the coatings that are on there that you paid for. Okay? That's basic lens care. Same thing, that same thing goes for your filters too. Um, sensor cleaning. If you've never cleaned a sensor before, I recommend you watch videos. There's a video. Uh, go to 
the angry photographer just there's a little bit if you go to his website like any website there's a uh, on the top there's a little magnifying glass and just type in sensor cleaning and he'll show you how to do it the product is eclipse okay and sensor swabs okay basically your sensor you want to lightly blow the dust on it the the bulb get the dust off right you hit it with a little bit of air never compress the air those things are too powerful the bulb just get the dust off you get a clean new sensor swab they look like uh, white squeegees you put one drop of eclipse sensor cleaner liquid on it you go once the, the swab will cover the whole width of the sensor and they come in different sizes for different size sensors you go once twice and you throw the, that cleaning swab away then you get a magnifying glass and you look to see if there's any more and if there's more you keep going then of course the final way is you take a photograph of a white wall you take a photograph and then you blow up that photograph of just your white wall with no lens i take a picture with no lens on it and you look at that in post and you look at each and every millimeter of the sensor you have that photograph up on your screen and you try and locate any dust and hopefully you got all the dust off okay do not use these gummy things that they sell to clean your sensor hell no don't do it don't put your finger ever on the sensor okay but i highly recommend you go to the angry photographer's website just it's, you can watch him you can watch him do it okay uh macro photography i mentioned it a few seconds ago right bugs and flowers it is the most enjoyable thing in the world a day like this you come out there's billions and billions of bugs everywhere you look and there's billions of little wildflowers everywhere you look a macro lens a dedicated macro lens to your camera is very well worth it it'll be the sharpest it will most likely have autofocus if that's the system you have. But you know what? Not everybody can afford a macro lens. I have made many videos praising Hoya and Vivitar. They make close-up filters for every size filter thread. And the sets cost about $14 for brand new four, four filters in a pouch. Plus one, plus four, plus ten, plus two. And you can stack them or just use them. If you put a plus ten close-up filter on the front of your regular lens, whether it's a 50 millimeter lens or a 135 millimeter lens, you screw it on, you will drop dead that you can get the quality of the photographs. Just go to my last, I don't know how many videos ago, but look up Pentex 645D. I made a video using my medium format digital camera, Pentex 645D, with a close-up filter. Not a close-up lens, close-up filter. You look at those photographs. You tell me that a $14 set of close-up filters isn't the best bang for your buck. Were they out of focus? No. Were they sharp? Yes. Was there beautiful blurred backgrounds? Yes. Was the color good? Yes. Contrast? Yes. Just give yourself a chance with close-up filters. Nobody's buying them. And you can go either, this is, this is where I found the cheapest prices for these, Amazon. eBay has them higher then Amazon. So if your lens takes a 52 millimeter filter, just go to Amazon and put in close up filter 52 millimeter. That's all you have to put in. And here they'll come. You'll see Vivitar and Hoya. Hoya's my favorite, Vivitar just as good. And I just bought a set for another lens. They're so cheap, you can get close-up filters for every lens you have. 14 bucks for a set of four. 
You can have a plus 10, and you can add a plus 2 to have plus 12. And amazing. The fun you can have. And here's the other thing. You could shoot these photographs in your home. I've taken, for example, fresh strawberries, right? And I mushed them. And I found uh, yellow jackets. You, know, you guys call them hornets or whatever, bees. And you put them, of course it was dead. You put them on top of these mushy strawberries and some fresh ones, right? We're only talking about an area of about four inches that you need to take macro photographs. And you put your camera on a tripod and you zoom in using the close-up filters and your lighting, I like to use these little LED steady lights. You see them on Amazon, they're little cubes, they're LEDs, they're rechargeable, the cheapest chips. And I use two of them, sometimes three, but you only, you only really need two. And that's enough lighting. In fact, sometimes it's enough lighting that I don't even need the tripod. Shoot it at uh, ISO of 800, and you can, you can hand hold these shots. And they're gorgeous. I will show you examples at the end of this video. Um, simple, simple, simple. I made a whole video about the Sunny 16 rule is dead. It's dead. I won't beat it to death because it's already dead. Don't use it. If you have a vintage camera, right, we're talking about film cameras here. If you have a vintage camera and it doesn't have a working light meter, don't guess, buy a Sekonic light meter. That's all I'll say, I have a whole video on that. Flash. Today, today, right, it's about one o'clock now in the afternoon, but today, this morning, I got a phone call from an old client that said, oh, we forgot to book you last week. Is there any chance you could come to the house? This was 9 a.m. Good thing I'm an early riser. I get up at 5 a.m. Is there any way you can come to the house right now? My son is graduating from his, uh, what do you call it, public school. Can you come take graduation pictures at home? Oh, look at this. His little brother's back. Look, look, look. I don't know if you can see him. Can you see the deer? so cute anyway I just love deer okay where was I okay rule thirds <laughs> uh, so what am I getting at I'm getting at oh there he goes there he goes take it out yeah we're in the city deer crossing <laughs> I'm sorry I'm sorry but I just I just enjoy I just enjoy seeing deer. Oh my goodness gracious. They're the most beautiful things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know about deer ticks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't comment about deer ticks. Okay? Comment about anything else, but I know all about deer ticks. Okay. I got the phone call. Can you come to the house? My son's graduating public school, which is fifth grade. We forgot to book you. We need professional pictures taken. Those grandmas here from Italy. Oh, ba ba ba. I said, of course. Of course. You never let down a client that's called you for 25 years. Got in the car, went over the bridge, parked, went, took the pictures outdoors. Here's the point of the story. Flash photography is not just for indoor. I used flash on every single one of the pictures. <coughs> Pardon me. It was just as bright as it is now. See the shadow on my face? That's not going to look good in a photograph of these, this kid graduating and grandma and great grandma. You need film flash. Flash photography is one of the most non-discussed topics in all of YouTube photography world. Please use your flash if you're taking a picture of somebody outside in this harsh, horrible strong lighting you need flash and now with digital cameras you can see how your picture comes out before everybody disappears 
right if you have to adjust your exposure okay oh this is my favorite this is my favorite 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 topic you guys are getting right on top of me here okay it's my favorite topic golden hour golden hour golden hour happens twice a day in the morning at sunrise and in the evening at sunset. There are apps, do it right now. Go on your cell phone and go to your Play Store or wherever the apps are, they're free. Just put in Golden Hour, Golden Hour app, and it will tell you in your area, you put in what area you're in, it will tell you the, to the minute of what time Golden Hour will be that day and then the next morning and the next evening, and it goes into the blue hour, which is gorgeous it's what happens as the sun's even getting lower those warm tones in the for golden hour they're in the 2500 kelvin area of the color chart okay just look up 2500 kelvin that gorgeous gold tone you know like on your slider when you're post-processing and you warm tone right that's artificial try and capture that live and you know what it's good for your soul to watch a sunset or a sunrise oh unbelievable okay we're really moving now you see this book see this book get this book i have purchased over 50 copies of this book and gave them out to people that I've taught photography to. This book, Photo Basics, by Joel Satori, National Geographic. Okay? Photo Basics. If you read this book, which is not that thick, if you read this book, take your time. Read two pages a night. You read this book, you will be no longer an amateur photographer if you use what he says in this book to build your foundation and you will build your photography art on top of this foundation picture this as one of the bricks okay Joel Satori is perhaps the most wonderful photographer huh? aperture he goes over everything you want to know. The index in the back, right? If you just want to brush up on one particular item, right? The index chock full. It'll have whatever you're looking for in this book. Now, the whole title, National Geographic, Photo Basics, The Ultimate Beginner's Guide to Great Photography, Joel Satori, creator of the photo arc. Okay? Where do you get this book? I get my books. Whether it's for one of my kids or for one of my students in photography. I try and get used books on Amazon. Now listen, before you click buy it now, this is what you do. There are many, many, many thrift bookstores on eBay. Get your, this is the paperback version, the soft cover. That's all you need. You don't need a new one. Buy them used. Look on eBay. Search by Buy It Now. Lowest price. Then go to Amazon. Amazon also sells used books. In fact, I think that that's how they started, by selling books. It will, this book, in mint minty condition there's not one pencil mark in here five dollars all right i don't know how much this book oh here us was 20 bucks new it says 20 bucks and in canada sorry canada 26 dollars all right i don't buy them new there's no reason to i buy them used this book was five dollars and they ship it media mail which is the cheapest way to ship anything in the world okay printed matter you, if you're a beginner, or maybe you've been a photographer for a couple of years, 
but you don't know everything. Get this book, Photo Basics, Joel Sartori, S-A-R-T-O-R-E. Joel Sartori. I give that book out. I don't even sell it to my students or to my family, my nieces and my nephews. I don't sell it. I give it to them. I go, read this book. Read this book with your camera in your hand and go, oh, oh my God, look at that. When I changed the aperture, I could see the background clear when it's down by F16. Oh, and when it's F28, I get more light, but the background's more, etc. Okay? So, you're going to get this book. Whether you're an amateur, right? Or a prosumer, right? This is the book I want you to get. Joe Sartori is one of the best authors out there. He's intelligent. Look, it says National Geographic. I think that says it all, okay? We have gone very far today. And don't forget, we're not done. We are now going to look at photographs that I took covering all of the points that I meant, just mentioned, right? Leading line, blurry background, macro, etc. Have a great day. Let's look at the photographs I took to cover today's video right now. And don't forget, thank you for making this channel hit 1,000 subscribers. I love you guys. Hold on, here we go. Let's look at the photos right now.